G'day everyone, and welcome back to the 39 Steps. When we last left our intrepid hero, Richard Hannay, we were impersonating a road repairman. We had just seen off the local road inspector, and he was convinced that it was us. And now, we enter Roadside Deception. Where it appears as though we're going to be coming face to face with our enemies in our disguise. So let's see what happens as we continue the 39 steps. Alright, it's Wednesday the 27th of May. Pebble... Shire, Scotland. Or people, Shire, Scotland. Alright, sounds like we're working away. Oh, a car has arrived. Just about midday, a big car stole down the hill. Glided past and drew up a hundred yards beyond. Its three occupants descended as if to stretch their legs and sauntered towards me. Okay. Two of the men I had seen before from the window of the Galway Inn. One lean, sharp and dark, the other comfortable and smiling. Dun, dun, dun. The third had the look of a countryman, a vet perhaps, or a small farmer. He was dressed in ill-cut knickerbockers, and the eye in his head was as bright and wary as a hen. Hmm. There we go. Let's see what happens. Morning. That's a fine, easy job of yours. Uh. I slowly and painfully straightened my bag. After the roadman spat vigorously after the manner of the low Scot and regarded them steadily before replying. There's real jobs, and there's better. I would rarely have yours, sitting a day on your hinderlands in eight cushions. It's you and your muckle cores that wreck my roads. If we all had our ricks, you should be made to mend what you break. The bright-eyed man was looking at the newspaper lying beside Turnbull's bundle. I see you get your papers in good time. Aye. In good time, seeing that that paper come out last Saturday, I'm just six days late. He picked it up and glanced at the superscription, and laid it down again. You've a fine taste in boots. These were never made by a country shoemaker. They were not. They were made in London. I got them through the gentleman that was here last year for the shooting. What was his name now? I scratched a forgetful head. Let us get on. This fellow is all right. Let us get on. This fellow is all right. Did you see anyone pass early this morning? He might be on a bicycle or he might be on foot. I very nearly fell into the trap and told a story of a bicyclist hurrying past in the grey dawn. Uh, wasn't up very early, you see. My daughter was married last night, and we keep it up late. I opened the house door about seven, and there was nobody on the road then. Since I come up here, there has just been the baker and the rock hill herd besides you gentlemen. One of them gave me a cigar, which I smelt gingerly, and stuck it in Turnbull's bundle. They were out of sight in three minutes, and my heart leapt with enormous relief. I went on my, I went on wheeling my stones. It was, w it was as well. For ten minutes later, the car returned. One of the occupants waving a hand to me. Those gentry left nothing to chance. I finished Turnbull's bread and cheese, and pretty soon I had finished the stones. 
And the next step was what puzzled me. I had a notion that the cordon was still tight around the glen, and that if I walked in any direction, I should meet with questions. Get out I must. No man's nerve could stand more than a day of being spied on. Then suddenly... Excuse me. May I trouble you for a light? Hmm. By an amazing chance, I knew him. His name was Marmaduke Chopley, and he was an offence to creation. Marmaduke Chopley. First meeting. I had a bit business introduction to his firm when I came to London. He was a good chat, and he was good enough to ask me to dinner at his club. There he showed off at a great rate and patted about his duchesses till the snobbery of the creature turned me sick. <coughs> I asked a man afterwards why nobody kicked him and was told that Englishmen reverenced the weaker sex. Hmm. Okay. He was a sort of blood stockbroker who did his business by toadying eldest sons and rich young peers and foolish old ladies. He would crawl a mile in his belly for anything that had a title or a meaning. Anyhow, there he was now, nattily dressed, and in, a, in a fine new car, obviously on his way to visit some of his smart friends. And he hadn't a clue who I was. Right. Jump in. Ah, hello, Jobly. Uh, well met, my lad. Who the devil are you? My name's Hanny, oh, from Rhodesia, uh, you remember? Good God, the murderer! Just so. And there'll be a second murder, oh, my dear, uh, if you don't do as I tell you. Give me that coat of yours, that cap oh, too. <laughs> Carjacking! He did his bid, for he was blind with terror. Over my dirty trousers and vulgar shirt, I put on his smart driving coat, which I buttoned high at the top, and thereby hid the deficiencies of my collar. I stuck the cap on my head and added his gloves to my get-up. The dusty roadman in a minute was transformed in one of the neatest motorists in Scotland. On Mr. Jopley's head, I clapped Turnbull's unspeakable hat and told him to keep it there. <coughs> now, my child... Sit quite still and be a good boy. I mean you no harm. I'm only borrowing your car for an hour or two. But if you play me any tricks, and above all, if you open your mouth, as sure as there's a god above me, I'll wring your neck. Savvy? Just, just don't hurt me. I enjoyed that evening's ride. <laughs> Very much there. As the dark felt, I turned up a side glen into an unfrequented corner of the hills. Soon the villages were left behind, then the farms, and then even the wayside cottage. Here we stopped, and obligingly reversed the car and restored Mr. Jopley his belongings. A thousand thanks. There's more use in you than I thought. Now be off and find the police. I'll get you! As I sat on the hillside, I reflected on the various kinds of crime I had now sampled. Contrary to general belief, I was not a murderer, but I had become an unholy liar, a shameless imposter, 
and a highwayman with a marked taste for expensive motor cars. Okay. The game is up. The things are looking desperate for Hane. As his pursuers gain the upper hand, running is the only option. Or is it? Bum bum bum. Thursday, the 28th of May, 1914, Peoplesshire, Scotland. Hmm. I spent the night on the hillside. It was a cold business, for I had neither coat nor waistcoat. These were in Mr. Turnbull's keeping, as was Scudder's little book, my watch, and worst of all, my pipe and tobacco pouch. Only my money accompanied me in my belt, and about half a pound of ginger biscuits in my trouser pocket. I supped off half those biscuits, and was worming myself deep into the heather. And by worming myself deep into the heather, I got some kind of warmth. So far, I had been miraculously lucky. My chief trouble that I was, was that I was desperately hungry. I lay and tortured myself, for the ginger biscuits merely empathized the aching void with the memory of all the good food I had thought so little of in London. I longed hopelessly for these dainties to fall asleep. Oh, I, in longing, in longing hopelessly for these dainties, I fell asleep. Sorry. I woke very cold and stiff about an hour after dawn. It took me a little while to remember where I was. I raised myself on my arms and looked down into the valley. And that one look set me lacing up my boots in mad haste. There were men below, not more than a quarter of a mile off, spaced out on the hillside like a fan, and beating the heather. Mami had not been slow in looking for his revenge. I scrambled to the top of the ridge. My pursuers were patiently quartering the hillside and moving upwards. Keeping behind the skyline, I ran for maybe half a mile. Then I showed myself. The line of search had changed its direction. I pretended to retreat over the skyline, but instead went back the way I had come. In 20 minutes, I was behind the ridge overlooking my sleeping place. The police had evidently called in local talent to their aid, and the men I could see had the appearance of herds or gamekeepers. The exercise had warmed my blood, and I was beginning to enjoy myself. I trusted to the strength of my legs, but I was well aware that those behind me would be familiar with the lay of the land, and that my ignorance would be a heavy handicap. My stratagem had given me a fair start, all 20 minutes, and I had the width of the glen behind me before I saw the first head of the pursuers. Ooh, come on. From that viewpoint, I had the satisfaction of seeing the pursuit, the pursuit streaming up the hill to the top of the glen on a hopelessly false scent. It began to seem less of a game. Those fellows behind were hefty men on their native heath. Looking back, I saw that only three were following direct. And I guessed the others had fetched a circuit to cut me off. I resolved to get out of this tangle of the glens to the pocket of moor I had seen from the tops. I put on a great spurt and got off my ridge and down into the moor before any figures peered on the skyline behind me.
Clearly the road ran to a house, and I began to think of doing the same. Mm, don't think we have any option. nice looking house too. I saw the face of an elderly gentleman meekly watching me from within the glass veranda. Seated at the, seated at the knee hole desk was the, was the benevolent old gentleman with some papers and open volumes before him. His face was round and shiny with big glasses stuck on the end of his nose and the top of his head was bright and bare as a glass bottle. You seem in a hurry, my friend. I nodded towards the window. It gave a prospect across the moor and revealed figures half a mile off staggering through the heather. Ah, I see. A fugitive from justice, eh? Well, we'll go into the matter at our leisure. Meantime, I object to my privacy being broken in upon by the clumsy rural policeman. Go into my study and you will see two doors facing you. Take the one on the left and close it behind you. You will be perfectly safe. Once again, I had found an unexpected sanctuary. The master of the house, sitting in a deep armchair, now regarded me with curious eyes. Are they gone? They have gone. I convinced them that you'd cross the hill. I do not choose that the police should come between me and one whom I am delighted to honour. This is a lucky morning for you. Mr. Richard Hanny. As he spoke, his eyelids seemed to tremble and to fall a little over his greedy, his keen grey eyes. In a flash, the phrase of Scudder's came back to me when he described the man he most dreaded in the world. He said that he could hood his eyes like a hawk. I saw that I had walked straight into the enemy's headquarters. Uh, okay. He seemed to anticipate my intention, for he smiled gently and nodded to the door behind me. I turned and saw two men servants who had me covered with pistols. Uh, he knew my name, but he had never seen me before. And as the reflection darted across my mind, I saw a slender chance. I, I don't know what you mean. And who were you calling Richard Annie? My name's Ainsley. So? Uh, but of course you have others. We won't quarrel about a name. I was pulling myself together now, and I reflected that my garb lacking coat and waistcoat and collar would at any rate not betray me. I put on my serious face and shrugged my shoulders. I suppose you're going to give me up after all. And I call it a damn dirty trick. Oh, God. I wish I'd never seen that cursed motor car. Here's the money and be damned to you. He opened his eyes a little. Oh, no. I shall not give you up. My friends and I will have a little private settlement with you. That is all. You know a little too much, Mr. Hanny. You're a clever actor, but not quite clever enough. <laughs> he spoke with assurance, but I could see the drawing of a doubt in his mind. For God's sake, stop jawing! 
Everything is against me. I haven't had a bit of luck since I came on shore at Leaf. What's the arm in a poor devil with an empty stomach picking up some money he finds in a bust-up motor car? That's all I've done, and for that, I've been chivied for two days by those blasted bobbies over those blasted hills. I tell you, I'm fair sick of it. You know what you like, old boy? Ned Ainsley's got no fight left in him. I could see the gout was... I could see the doubt was gaining. You oblige me with the story of your recent doings. I can't, Governor. I've not had a bite to eat for two days. Give me a mouthful of food, and then you'll hear God's truth. Ah, oh, they're going that way. Yes. I wolf them down like a pig, or rather, like Ned Ainsley, who was keeping up my character. Then I told him my story. God's Truth, Part 1. Ned Ainsley was a common Londoner who had arrived at Leith a week ago and was making his way overland to his brother at Weektown. He found three sovereigns lying on the seat of a bust-up car and another on its floor. There was nobody there or any sign of an owner. So Ainsley pocketed the cash. I must say I do like these bits. He tried to change a sovereign at the baker's, but the woman cried out cried on the police. Police! Police And phoned him with a Rolling pin. A little later. The police had tracked him down and Ainsley was on the run across Scotland. can have the money back for a fat lot of good he's done me. Those perishers are all down on a poor man. Now, if it had been you, Governor, that had found the quids, nobody would have troubled you. You're a good liar, Hanny. Stop fooling, damn you. I tell you, my name's Ainsley, and I've never heard of anyone called Anna in my born days. I'd sooner have the police than you with your Hannays and your monkey face pistol tricks. No, no, Governor, I beg pardon. I don't mean that. I'm much obliged to you for the grub, and I'll, I'll thank you to let me go now the coast's clear. It was obvious that he was badly puzzled. He had never seen me, and my appearance must have altered considerably from my photographs. I do not propose to let you go. If you are what you say you are, you will soon have a chance of clearing yourself. If you are what I believe you are, I do not think you will see the light much longer. He rang a bell, and a third servant appeared from the veranda. I want the Lanchester in five minutes. There will be three to luncheon. <coughs> you will know me next time, Governor! Carl, stecke diesen in the larder. Und bis ich zurückkomme, bist du mir vor ihm verantwortlich. I was marched out of the room with a pistol at each ear. We invent desperate measures. All right. 
Well, I think I'm going to leave this episode here. When we come back, we're going to uh, see how Hannah gets out of this tight jam. So I want to thank you all for joining us. If you enjoyed this episode of The 39 Steps, please remember to leave a like, thumbs up, all that good stuff. And if you're new to the channel, please subscribe and hit that notification icon because you'll get a notification when we do The 39 Steps again and this, all the other awesome games, Subsistence, 7 Days to Die, RimWorld. So yeah, uh, thanks again for joining us and until uh, next time. Ladies.